Say it with me now. Dragon Ball GT is not canon. Dragon Ball GT was supposed to be the original post-Dragon Ball Z series, carrying a lot of the components and all of the same characters from the end of Z into a new set of storylines, involving newer, stronger villains, and even a new set of Dragon Balls, dubbed the Black Star Dragon Balls, because reasons. It certainly had some strange components to it, though. It was set ten years after the end of Z, Pan and Trunks are all grown up, Gohan is apparently some kind of lecturer or something, Goku's a kid again, and... Uh, wait, what was that last one? Yes, by some bizarre circumstance, the series revolved around Emperor Pilaf wishing that Goku was a child again with the Black Star Dragon Balls, and Goku having to get back the Dragon Balls, which are now all over the galaxy and have to be found within a year or Earth explodes. You know, typical Dragon Ball stuff. Also, side note, Toriyama had no storyline involvement with the series, and the series was not based off any of his manga, so... For all its downsides, though, Dragon Ball GT doesn't necessarily deserve all the flack that it gets. It contained the fewest storyline inconsistencies of any Dragon Ball series thus far, the characters were designed in much the same way Toriyama would have designed them, and it still maintained the familiar Dragon Ball feel. So if you haven't already seen it, I'm compelling you to actually give the series a chance. I'm Eric with Team Badman, and we're looking at five reasons why Dragon Ball GT was actually good. Number 5. Minimal Filler Compared to both the original Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z, there was very little room in Dragon Ball GT for any kind of filler episodes. The most filler component of GT, in all honesty, was what was dubbed the Lost Episodes, which weren't initially dubbed over and instead used to piece together a summarized episode entitled A Grand Problem by Funimation. It cut the first 15 episodes down into one, in order to move immediately into the Baby Saga, where there's real action and a more Dragon Ball Z-esque feel. For what it's worth, the Lost Episodes are really silly. A wish is made with the Black Star Dragon Balls, which are then scattered across the galaxy and have to be returned to the plan upon which the wish was made within one year, or else it explodes. Yeah, you heard that right. It explodes. So Goku, Trunks, and his granddaughter Pan, who is now taller than him by the way, go on a hunt to find them, and along the way major mishaps occur. Their dragon radar is eaten by a robot named Giru, the gang saves a planet from a tyrant after their ship gets stolen, Trunks poses as the giant monster's bride to get him to stop causing earthquakes... yeah... But that's really the only filler in the series. Episode 16, Giru's Checkered Pass, starts off the saga of compelling villains in General Rildo and Dr. Mew, ultimately culminating in the appearance of Baby and the return of the Tuffles, who were mentioned very few times in Dragon Ball Z and became more of an afterthought, if anything. From there, it's full throttle forward through the remaining 48 episodes for what becomes a brief yet intense ride of creative ideas and faces, both old and new. Number 4. The Villains While they may have had less time to truly develop as characters or make their longevity known, the villains of Dragon Ball GT were not only just as dangerous as you would expect from the series, but even more compelling, since they actually had motive behind their villainy besides, I find good guys, I kill them. A combination of old references, new designs, and some strange ideas for gaining power made them just as evil as they were unique. Let's start with the first major villain of the series, Baby. Baby was a throwback reference to the Tuffles, who were mentioned one time during Z in a filler episode called Goku's Ancestors, but mainly were given their due in the plan to eradicate the Saiyans OVA involving Dr. Raichi and the giant monster Hachiak. The Tuffles were mainly pacifists with incredible technology at their disposal, and coexisted with the Saiyans at one time. However, King Vegeta, mentioned as a Saiyan with the cunning of a Tuffle, led the much more populous Saiyans to war against the Tuffles in order to assert their dominance and take over the planet they co-inhabited. This gives Baby a bloodborne motive against all Saiyans, as he was designed to contain the genetic information of the entire Tuffle race in his DNA. When Baby took his most powerful form by occupying Vegeta's body and combining their powers, it both gave him a measure of vengeance in taking over one of the most powerful Saiyans in then known existence, and a nearly unparalleled power only matched when Goku attained the Super Saiyan 4 transformation. It's a feature that few other Dragon Ball villains really had, and it made for a great first major arc. Next in line is Super Android 17, whose purpose was twofold. The more pronounced one during the arc was 17's desire to assert himself as the ultimate android, which he had already been designed to believe. 
Tracing back to Dragon Ball Z, however, it also has to be accounted for that 17's original purpose was to destroy Goku. This part of his personality remained, and when combined with the ultimate android aspect, gives him a very clear motive for his very brief time in the show. Of course, later on, 17 turns against creators, which seems to be a hallmark of his character, imagine that, but it makes him nonetheless a very reason-driven villain. And lastly, we have the Shadow Dragons. While there's a degree of silliness to the embodiment of the Dragon Balls as a set of not very dragon-looking dragons, the fact that each individual Shadow Dragon is the result of a specific wish from the series, as well as the fact that they exhibit the backlash from abusing the power of the seven power-filled spheres throughout the entire canon, makes them a truly unique final set of villains. While each one's power is based on a wish made during the series, Nova Shenron being based from Piccolo's wish for his youth in Dragon Ball, Ice Shenron from erasing the memories of Majin Buu from everyone at the end of Dragon Ball Z, and so on, no monster exhibits the backlash more than Sin Shenron, who later becomes Omega Shenron by absorbing all seven Dragon Balls. Born from Mr. Popo's wish to revive all of the Namekians who were killed by Frieza, which was also the only wish that made Shenron question if he could do it, as opposed to Krillin's wish for Android 18 to be human, which he said that he outright could not do, it's a brilliant way of bringing one of the series' crucial components full circle, showing how the incredible power of the Dragon Balls does have a price, one that almost destroyed the plan that Goku and friends had worked so hard to preserve. Number 3 the animation. So while GT isn't canon, say it with me, Dragon Ball GT is not canon. And it seems readily apparent that Super is the natural continuation of the series after Battle of the Gods was released in 2013, there's one thing that the latter is definitely lacking in, and that's animation quality. Uh... Uh... Oh... Oh... Oh, no. That's one thing that GT actually excelled in, and perhaps even exceeded both Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z in, the animation style. While some of the color scheme and shading was more pallid and altogether dark at times, especially compared to the lushness of the later Dragon Ball Z arcs, it showed a great amount of effort on Toriyama's part to recreate what is a now unique and noticeable art style. Animations were smooth, the designs were consistent with the remainder of the series, and as long as we ignore Vegeta's moustache, the returning cast is exactly as they were remembered. While Toriyama only provided a degree of creative input, and the rest was the work of Toei Animation, they did a great job of sticking to the source design and material. Much due is also necessary to Katsuyoshi Nakatsuru, who was the field character designer for all of Dragon Ball GT, as well as many of the later episodes of Dragon Ball Z, and a key character designer for figures such as Bardock. Speaking of him, he also just so happened to design... Number 2. The Design of Super Saiyan 4 Arguably one of the biggest moments in the entirety of GT is the moment the dust settles in Episode 35, Goku's Ascension, and he comes out with this look unlike anything that the series had seen so far. Red fur covering everywhere but his pectorals, a flame-like aura, and the return of the Saiyan's tail exemplified that Super Saiyan 4 was something unique unto itself, both a Saiyan transformation and an entirely new beast. Sure, it looks like he's wearing red guy liner and he's two tattoos and an angsty love song away from being a part of My Chemical Romance, but that's beside the point. Super Saiyan 4 represented an evolution in the power and creativity of Saiyan transformations, and really harkened back to the primal power of what being a Saiyan was once all about. This is only further verified in how Goku initially reaches the form, transforming into a mighty golden Ozaru in the presence of Blutz waves created by sunlight bouncing off the Earth. There's some components of the other transformations too. The long hair resembles Super Saiyan 3, but not entirely, the increase in musculature is reminiscent of the ascended Super Saiyan transformation seen in the Cell Saga, and the red aura when powered up is a throwback to Goku's Kaioken ability. Though GT is no longer canon, as I mentioned before, this is one moment that I feel was greatly understated for what it could have represented, the ultimate culmination of the Saiyan transformation. This is even mentioned by Old Kai in episode 34 back in the game, referring to it as the ultimate level, it's almost a parallel of GT in itself, taking components that are both old and new and turning them into something unique and altogether amazing. While it's not as wholly impactful as Goku's original Super Saiyan transformation against Frieza on planet Namek, 
it's still a moment to get really hype about. Number one, the final episode. Every great series should end with a powerful and lasting final episode, and Dragon Ball GT did exactly that. With the Shadow Dragons defeated at the hands of the Universal Spirit Bomb and the Dragon Balls purified, Shenron makes one final appearance to grant Goku the wish of restoring the Earth. He then tells Goku that he is taking the Dragon Balls and leaving with them for 100 years in order to prevent their corruption once again. He asks Goku to come with him, using Goku's positive energy to help empower one last wish without any negative side effects. Saying goodbye to his many friends, including one last sparring match with Krillin and a visit to Piccolo in Hell, Goku departs on Shenron's back and becomes one with the Dragon Balls. 100 years later, Goku returns as an adult and reminisces on the past, ultimately flying off on the Flying Nimbus with the power pole in hand and yelling out, Till we meet again, guys. Set amid flashbacks of the entire series, Until We Meet Again is a phenomenal final episode, tying everything together and giving it an epic feel. It references some of Goku's greatest moments, from meeting Bulma and Master Roshi, to defeating famous nemeses like Piccolo, Frieza, and Majin Buu. It reflects a future without Goku, where the Earth is once again safe and fighting is done for the sake of enjoyment, not for fear of humanity's destruction. All of this is capped off by Goku's last line in the series, which is nearly identical to the one Grandpa Gohan stated to Goku in Dragon Ball before returning to the other world. While much changed throughout the hundreds of episodes between the original Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z, and Dragon Ball GT itself, the final episode delivers the feeling that Goku is still the same happy-go-lucky character we met at the very beginning. While the struggles may have been many, some great and some not so great, it's a fitting farewell to one of anime's most iconic and beloved characters. Whether or not Super manages to deliver the same kind of feeling is yet to be seen, but it's got a tough challenge ahead if it's going to top this one. And that's our list. Do you guys like it? If you did, click the like button down below. If not, click the dislike button down below and let us know what you guys didn't like. We're always looking to improve this for future lists and videos, so if you've got any suggestions, please leave them down in the comments section below. Also, if you haven't already, be sure to click the subscribe button down below, as well as check out all of our social media links down in the description. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Twitch, so be sure to come say hey to us over there and like, comment, and subscribe. We would love to interact with you guys. So that's going to do it for this episode. I'm Eric with Team Badman signing out, and like always, guys, stay bad. Thanks for watching.